joined now by someone who started off at BBC on shows such as Juliet Bravo, EastEnders, Miss Marple, before moving into producing. But she'd actually started not in production, but in costume. So I'd like to introduce Jo Newbury. How are you? Hi, I'm fine, thanks. I and wasn't you... actually a producer, I was an associate producer. Slight, slight difference there. <laughs> Oh, but still many of the I suppose, same responsibilities, perhaps just not with the, the title, sadly. Uh, yes, I mean, we were, we were focused on the budget rather than the, uh, the, the content and the casting. So we just dealt with the rest of it. <laughs> all the difficulties then. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Sorry? All, all the uh, difficult bits then. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Yes, the crewing, the scheduling, the logistics, the timing, the organising things, yeah. But I wanted to take you back to 1987 when you encountered Doctor Who uh, in, in his production side of things as an assistant floor manager on Time of Marley. What does a AFM do or what did they do? Because I appreciate it's an outdated term. Uh, assistant floor manager... Um, it's a bit like being an assistant stage manager in the theatre. In TV and in the TV production days, uh, back in the 80s, um, a production team would consi uh, consist of the director, uh, the production assistant, or who would probably be called continuity, but she would do continuity as well as all the other uh, pre-production scripts, casting. There'd be a production manager who would be organising the schedule, uh, organising the supporting artists, and the AFM would write the action prop list. The designer would be responsible for the uh, dressing props, but anything that the artist touch was the responsibility of the assistant floor manager and basically as a team you would be ensuring that the um, the flow and the realization of the script was achieved um, there would also be a location manager who maybe find the locations or that might sometimes just the production manager would do it sometimes you'd have a location manager as well um, and the AFM was a bit like a combination of a, a runner uh, a second AED um, and action props all rolled into one. So long ago that I did it, <laughs> I probably forgot something. Oh, yeah, That's so long since I worked, even. God dear, sorry. But but an AFM, you know, you're across all sorts then. So at what point in the production are you brought on? Are you brought in as soon as the sort of finished script is there or first day of rehearsals? <laughs> finished, nobody ever gets a finished script <laughs> when the production team sit down. Oh, well, you're very lucky if you get a finished script. And um, I, I joined, I think I joined at the same time as the producer, um, the PA and the PA and the production manager, we as a team would sit down. I think we probably had about six weeks before we started shooting. Um, so it's all, it's all the planning going forwards. Um, and I'm pretty sure we probably, yes, we must have had rehearsals. So it would have been my responsibility to mark up, organize props and suitable furniture, poles and whatever, mark up on the floor the studio sets um, on a floor in squares that was similar to the squares on the floor at the studio and you would rehearse and work out the moves so that um, and the AFM would plot those moves would record those moves against the script so that everybody could remember where they were going what they were doing and also if bits of furniture had to move or you would record it per scene as to where things needed to be to accommodate the camera because often things would move to let the camera through and then you'd have to various marks on the floor that you would translate into the studio so that you knew where to position the furniture 
So the, the paces that the artists made between one thing and another were the same in the rehearsal room as they were on the studio floor. So that when you did a tech run, uh, the camera operators, the, the, the sound, the lighting could all come and see where things were going to be happening and they could work out that everything was going okay for them, that they could get their cables running and they knew that whether they could get the angles or not and things could be adjusted if it wasn't working. Um, that was, <laughs> what else did I do? I'm sure, I'm sure I did loads of other things as well. <laughs> but in terms of something like Doctor Who, am I right in thinking that before you got into the rehearsal room, you were involved in the camera test for the next Doctor, Sylvester McCoy? We were, we, we, did, we did screen tests. I think there were about six people. Um, I can't quite remember what one what they had to do or two who they were but it was in prez prez b which is the present very small presentation studio which in fact on one of the things i've seen recently philip Schofield was saying he, he'd been taken to do a, a screen test in prez b and i'm pretty sure that's where the broom cupboard was that he landed up didn't he land up in the broom cupboard for a while yeah he had gordon the gopher didn't he but anyway that was behind the south hall lifts on the fourth floor, which is where the presentation and the continuity announcers lived. And that's where we went with um, Sylvester McCoy and uh, yeah, four or five others, I think. I don't know the names. I, I see people sometimes, I go, I'm sure, I'm sure they did a screen test for Doctor Who. <laughs> but I can't quite remember. God, it's, it's sad, my memory is um, not what it was. <laughs> so that must have made Doctor Who you know, a longer job than it would otherwise have been to have had this all this screen testing going on, or would that have been alongside prepping? I for the think I, th I think I think it was just alongside the prepping because um, you, as a production team, what we also used to do was cast the episodes. Um, the the director would. Um, come up with some ideas in fact we all used to come up with ideas and sort of thumb through spotlight um, and gradually come up with shortlist and people used to come into the production office and talk to the director and you know we were just part of the just part of the the team um, and we either had some input or we didn't you know whereas these days, it's very much sort of director and casting director and producer. But in individual episodes, it often, on, on lots of dramas, would be done in the, in the production office. We also, we would do um, production readings. We would time the script by reading out loud the script to make sure they were the right, because the, the length of the episodes were always so critical. So you would, you would read it to see how things panned out because obviously the director had an idea of what they hoped to achieve in the way it could be shot so um doing a a, a team read was also part of the process which uh, in later years i didn't notice you know, so many things i worked on where you know, they came out far longer than they should have done <laughs> a team read would have helped that along you know <laughs> You mentioned working alongside the director who for, for that story would have been Andrew Morgan. How was he to work with? Because it, it was a show full of not only you know, actors in prosthetics, but model shots, effects, there's a lot going on. Yeah, no, he's, he was great. He's great fun. He's really, you know, positive and, you know, fun. You know, he didn't, didn't create a, a tense atmosphere which sometimes directors could become incredibly intense because you know there's so much to get through but he he always had a really um i found a really uh, happy approachable uh, attitude to the work that needed to be done yeah and a lot of the story was done on location in the quarry would that all have yes. been done before rehearsals or how would that fit into it all well, it was certainly done before we were in the studio. Um, I can't remember if we rehearsed before 
we did that. Um, I would, I would imagine, given that it was Sylvester McCoy's first episode, there would have been some rehearsal. So I'm assuming we did some rehearsal before we went, because otherwise you, you know, it's um, just to get a feel, get into it. So yeah. Yes, then we go to a quarry. As ever with quarries, it was raining. It was very wet. So those beautiful creatures, I can't remember what their character name was, but they were so colorful and they had these big hair, and all covered in black bin bags to protect the beauty. Yes, it was very muddy. My, my poor hire car got into big trouble with the associate and Fagata. I'd say, do you know we had to pay extra one on your hire car when it went back because it needed to be cleaned. It was full of mud. It was very, very muddy. And she was probably telling me that I should have cleaned it before I sent it back. But I didn't know. I was actually how long had I? No, I'd been doing it for a while. I had been doing it a while. Yes, I became an AFM in uh, 1983. So this was four years later, or three and a half years later. But I suppose Doctor Who is a show that I suppose inevitably you encounter at some point being in that department, I imagine. Uh, yes, everybody worked on, seemed to get the go at Doctor Who. And whereas productions often used to move around the building, we were based in Union and Threshold. Um, j and John Nathan Turner's office, was a permanent fixture uh, across the corridor from the production office that we were in. And so I think that he always had his production offices nearby and the room next door to us, we had an adjoining door to. Now I'm not sure if it was actually the script editor's room or if it was just a script room because it was full of filing cabinets with old scripts in. And I remember going in and pulling open the drawers and going back and finding the original scripts, you know, 1963 with my dad's name on and all the rest of it. So that was next door. And then you'd go across the corridor and that John's office was to the right and straight ahead was his, um, his secretary. But it was, it was absolutely crammed with videos, um, old props, face masks. I've got a photo somewhere of, all those photos I can't find. I've got a photo of me wearing a mask that I found in the office. And of course there were all the, um, the cards, you know, the autograph cards, the picture cards of people. So yes, it was absolutely Doctor Who crammed full. Whereas often you do, when you do a show, you know, it's just, it's just another room with, without any history. Whereas Doctor Who's offices were crammed with history yeah <laughs> and you mentioned finding some of those masks in the office your, your story had uh, actors dressed as tet traps which can't have been the easiest costumes to work with particularly no, think... starting out on location do you know i can't remember them on location i can only remember them on the, in the studio having to hang upside down you know having, having to have those harnesses double double clipped harnesses and hanging upside down all that time. I felt so sorry. For, and they were incredibly hot, those, those outfits that they were in. You know, they were pretty full on. As well as those, uh, Kate O'Mara was, was hung upside down as well. How was she to work with? Because this was her second encounter with Doctor Who. Yes, I didn't have anything to do with the first one, obviously. Um, and she, she was fine, but, you know. Good fun, as I recall. I do, I do remember seeing her in, at, at rehearsals. Yes, no, it's, it's good. And Bonnie Langford, I remember at rehearsal, and she would go off at lunchtime, and she disappeared off. She said, oh, I'm going round to, I think she was going to Macro. She's going to the cash and carry. Anybody want anything? I'm off to cash and carry. I thought, oh, who can go to a cash and carry? I didn't, I didn't realise how easy it was to go on to a cash and carry. But I, was, I was really impressed. She was going off to buy all sorts of things for her her family. It's, uh, yeah, no, it's good fun. <laughs> and Sylvester used to cycle into rehearsals, as I recall, along the towpath. Um, 
along the canal, which I hadn't even realised we were that close to the canal. But we were at North Acton, of course. So it was just down there a bit. And then we'd come up. Yeah. And, and with that being Sylvester's first story, how, how was he? Did he come into it quite confident? Or, or was you know, it quite a, a monster for Doctor Who to come into? Um, I, I, I can't really say how he found it. I mean, it's, it's just another job that you come and you do your best at, you know, it's, um, that's what every professional does. Um, I've, you put your own mark on it and, and obviously you've got to work with the material that you provided, you know, so, um, yes, you, you do the best you can. Um, I think, I think he got on it. Okay. And as we touched upon, you know, your association with Doctor Who actually goes way back to the 60s. Obviously, you weren't working on it, but it had been part of your life from an early age, hadn't it? Yeah, yeah. I was seven when my dad was working on the very first episode. He he was actually Peter, Peter Bukaki's assistant, um, and then it got reshot, didn't it? I think it had to be shot again, and uh, he took it on as designer although pre peter brackett had done the the first one and then he did the first four stories as designer um and continued alternating stories um with ray cusick certainly for the first series and it seemed to go on for years I, and and my dad tended to do the historical stories and ray seemed to do the futuristic stories um, and then he carried on throughout his time at the Beeb, although he, there was a period of time where he'd stopped doing so many Doctor Whos. Um, he would dip back in now and then. And in fact, I think he worked on Doctor Who as one of the very last things he did before he retired in 83. So, yeah. So in a, I think he still holds the record for having designed most episodes of Doctor Who. So yes, it's always been there. And we used to go and visit. My dad, even before he started working at Television Centre, um, I actually were at, I think the original, were they done at Lime Grove? I can't quite remember. But I do remember at school holidays, we would go and visit. And we would go and visit the studios and remember walking up um, Frithill Gardens and going in through the back gate. Um, and going to the restaurant block and then at lunch break you would could go into the studios I mean in fact it was a it was a tradition that con continued for years into into the 80s when he retired the, the designers would always go and walk through all the studios and I used to when I was working there I used to be able to go and do that with him but as a child you'd go in I'd go up with my mum and my sister and we'd go and visit the set I particularly going, remember going to see uh, the Marco Polo. No, was it Marco Polo? The one where it was Chinese. Anyway, it was fantastic, you know, luxurious sort of garden set, I think. And um, William Hartnell came through the door to the studio and saw us and went, get those children out of the studio and turn around and disappear. And it transpired it's because he didn't have his wig on. He didn't want to spoil the illusion that Doctor Who didn't really have long hair. But uh, not that we'd have been bothered, but anyway, <laughs> we, we weren't there to see him. <laughs> yeah. And we did get autographs. He got us autographs dated 19... Only 64, I think it, they were dated. But can I find them? Can't find them. <laughs> They're somewhere, but I think they might never show up. So. Well, hopefully one day they, they turn up. But so, with you know, with your dad in, in already at the BBC, was it perhaps a given that you would move into television in, in some form or another? Um, when I was at school, um, I remember being at home, they saying, oh, what do you want to be when you grow up? I said, oh, I want to be a producer. And they said, do you know what a producer does? And I said, 
Well, see this knife? I've just produced it from under the table. Uh, so I didn't really know what it was, but I did when I was at school uh, decide that yes, I would, I would head to work in television. And in fact, I think it's very much, uh, some people might call it nepotism. I don't think it's, I don't think it's necessarily nepotism. I just think it's that people who know people who work in TV know that it's an opportunity that you can follow. A lot of people didn't know that there were jobs to be had because there are lots of jobs that don't get on the credit. Well, most things on films get credits these days, but there are lots of jobs that people can do, but they don't realize how to access them or that they're available and, and could be done. So getting back to it, yes, I wanted, I thought I'd work in TV. Uh, I, when I left school, I, I said I was never ever going to take any more exams after my O-level. Um, and in fact, while my friends were all taking their A-levels, I was on location with my dad for four weeks filming um, a Thomas Hardy show, film, out of plays. Um, and I did that. It was actually a five-week shoot. Um, I went home for a week to take my driving test. Um, and went back again um, uh, and then I had a year off and thought well I'll go I thought I would apply for um, drama schools to do stage management and in the meantime I'd been in Spain for a couple of, I'd had a couple of jobs and somebody on a show that my dad was working said Apparently they're looking for dresses in the costume department. So I wrote to the costume department to say, um, I'd like to apply to be a dresser. And they said, you're too young to be a dresser, but we have got a position in the stockroom. So I went and told them I was planning on going to um, drama school. Um, so I got a temporary holiday relief job as a costume stockkeeper. I went for one interview at um, Central, I think it was, and decided that I didn't think I could live a life surrounded by lovers. They were all calling each other darling. and I thought, oh, no, I can't do that. So I, decide, I decided to become a teacher instead. So I got into Teach Training College because I, I thought, well, I've told the BBC I'm going to college. I've got to go to college. So I went to Teach Training College and did a year and a term teacher training and realised that I hated school. What, what on earth am I doing training to be a teacher when I couldn't bear being in school? So I left that. Um, and then I went back to being a costume stockkeeper for another six months. Um, and then left, went and worked somewhere else. And then I went back again. In, and after another six months, I went back. And then I stayed. And once I was back in 1977, I was back as a costume stockkeeper and did it loved it great fun I mean we really inter 13 hour days two days on two days off working at television center the costume stock rooms were on the third floor of television center and you could wander around the um well on the first floor the second floor go around the second floor and you could go into the viewing rooms to look at what was happening in the studios. Um, fantastic. And you'd go to the canteen and all the studios would break and the queues were just full of the weird and the wonderful and all the monsters from Doctor Who, all the people, the period, you know, at the, um, the Spike Milligans. I mean, it was just fantastic to be part of this absolutely buzzing, uh, factory making TV programs, 70s and 80s was absolutely, and in fact, 70s and early 80s, because dramas were still made in the studios, uh, gradually during the mid 80s, lots more was being made on location. I think because the use of the studio for a drama, it used the studio up for too long, because particularly if you were doing 60 minutes, you often would have to have three days in the studio and whether 
a day to set and day to, that was a week gone for that studio so they they started shipping them out but you know there were some fantastic dramas made in the studios that were lit fantastically that the sound was absolutely pristine and in fact if you look at them now they they do have a really theatrical quality because of course they didn't have as much incidental music in them um so the, the atmosphere is very different but yeah as uh, as things time went on you know they they didn't put as many dramas in the studios so they tended to be much more ellie comedy type things um so yeah where was i um so yes i i became i then after a while i became a dresser I'd done enough. I'd done two two years. I became a dresser in 1980 and did three years as a dresser, which was a fantastic way to learn how programs are made because you, you learn about continuity because you're responsible for the continuity of the costume that your artist is wearing. You're shooting out a sequence. You need to know what they were wearing and what their, you know, whether the collar was in or out, you know, which belt we're all these small details become important. So you learn about that. Meanwhile, you're you're working either in the studios or you're out on location, you're working on film, you're working on tape, you learn about lighting, you learn about focus. I mean, it's absolutely a brilliant way of just sucking in how things are, are done um and that's when i then applied to be an afm in drama series and serials and i think it actually was a training attachment across both plays and series and serials but um, series and serials were the lucky ones they got me <laughs> yeah and that led you to working on all sorts of shows Things like uh, Juliet Bravo, Miss Marple. You know, it, it must have been a wonderfully diverse department to be working in. Well, you know, I can I can plot my life through the shows. I mean, what was one wonderful? The first thing, well, actually, the first thing I did when I became an AFM was I worked at television training on the director's course, the external director's course, and so there were an intake of eight theatre directors coming to learn how to make TV um, and this was at when TV training was at Woodstock Grove and that was also quite bizarre because I was they would get studio exercises and they'd learn to look at captions and uh, shoot the captions they they shoot little sequences with with cameras and and I, I'd find myself telling people about things and I you know you this is when you really realize you do know quite a lot because actually you're helping people to learn something that it wasn't training me although I was learning I was helping them it was just, which was quite bizarre quite amazing um, but the first program I worked on was Angels which was shot in Birmingham and we did five episodes at a time they must have been I say that I don't I don't remember. I can't remember why I say we did five episodes at a time. I've got this thing of five in my head. But the director of that was Mary Ridge, and she was um classic old school um studio director, and she did absolutely everything pristinely. She had worked out her camera plans and the positions and everything, and I had to um, accommodate that in in the way in which things were marked up and every time you shot a scene you've got to move this bed two inches this way yeah, it, it was absolutely and she she liked her rehearsal room to be you know absolutely quiet and focused and you could hear you know the, it was three weeks of rehearsals so yeah, that's where I think there's five five episodes is probably good to and you just you just learnt the craft of that style of program making from her, which was quite amazing. 
yes then the next program i was going to do was i went on to was miss no it was juliet bravo and that we we had two production we we shot the studio inserts we would go up to um burnley and shoot the inserts for two episodes and but they were two different production teams but the afms uh ran for each other if you see what i mean while one was dealing with the action props and the action cars and what, whatever the other one was fetching the artists and coordinating what have you and you did it for each other dave david innes edwards was the other right, director yes and uh, so that was juliet bravo and then the next thing was miss marple a murder is announced and that was another great great thing to work on where the production manager when he was first you know absolutely pin drop nobody out there and the don't don't kick a light you know you learn never kick a, a light on a film set or if you do tell the dop because you know, so, you'd be in big trouble yes i did kick a light oh, really so sorry no, no. They, it was it was a great great thing to work on you know the wet the weather was good and we went to some fantastic locations and it was just fun and you know everything was new and fresh and great to do yeah what did i do after that it always seems that in a Miss Marple, every, it's gloriously sunny, and of course it's set in that wonderful period. You know, that, that obviously it was a period of peace, and it seems that everybody that worked in it loved it and loved Joan and, and the program, a very special one indeed. Yeah, it was, and in fact, the one that I worked on, um, there, were, there was quite a large cast, and it was we, we were set in Dorset, and so the older members of the cast. Joan, um, Paola Dianasotti, um, who else do we have? Um, Ursula Howells. Anyway, the old people, the, old, the older generation were in Yeovil in a, a hotel and the younger generation were in um, a hotel that was a walk away from the beach <laughs> just outside Bridport so it was it was rather nice yes yeah, Samantha Bond was one of the one of the young and of course Kevin Waitley was playing the um, the sidekick to the policeman this was before he became Lewis you know he to Morse this was He'd already been the, the policeman's sidekick in Miss Marple. So yeah, after that, 1985, what did I, 1985, oh, it was, um, yeah, the end of 84, of course, it was EastEnders. I was at EastEnders when it was called East 8, it was in development, and then went up to Elstree, and we... We did have scripts and we um we shot on the lot but it was all shakedown we shot in the studio it was but it was all just practice and we did it over and over again and in the end we're going can't we use it for real and we i did the very first the one and only read through of the cast um that's when um they recast um angie that's when Anita Dobson came in and then it didn't start you know the routine was you know this turnaround you would have um, a, a day shooting on the lot and the following week you would be doing two days in the studio and we rehearsed we rehearsed on Saturday mornings Friday and Saturday mornings you would, and Mondays and Tuesdays you would do a, and you do a tech run and a prod, producers run to do the the uh, studio Tuesdays and Wednesdays, and there were three teams to do the first eighteen episodes, and we would we had had that extra three months at the beginning 
the end of 1984 where we were shaking everything down yes remember cleaning the toilets at um actually i don't think i did it i think morag bain and sue hedden cleaned the toilets before the read through um, but we had two huge rooms that were the rehearsal areas that had you know big um the laundrette the stock set we had the laundrette and the, the queen vic with great big purpose-built bar these areas are all part of holby now that's where holby shop in what were the east enders rehearsal rooms well of course you know it's such a, a machine really to to produce that many episodes yes yes and has to be very very carefully planned and that's why on a show like that having the script in good time so that you can you know the, they, they have a, a scheduler to plot what can go where to make sure that you can get all your artists available to do the number of episodes it, it is a huge conundrum to make it um, work very complex so by the time you're your production associates you're working on things like murder in mind screenplay you know, interesting projects that i perhaps don't think you'd get today you sort of knew all the ins and outs of, of everything at the bbc both having been in production and as a dresser then uh yeah sort of you know it's funny because yes you know about a bit about costume and as as a result of having been in costume you work really closely with makeup um so you're sort of familiar with their needs and requirements my dad having been a designer and i'd been away with him as part of his team as i say when i was at school you learn about the, the the working ahead because design always seems to work ahead of the shoot you know the shoot arrive and the team that have created the set move on to the the next one you know you, you've got some people who are doing standby um the rest of the team are working ahead making the next place ready or striking the one you've just left um and then of course i'm married to a visual effects designer so you know i was familiar with them um, you know the needs of those sort of people but i think that's probably more than most sort of experience by that point you know it's some obviously people had worked their way through production but very rarely had such an understanding of everything else well, wow. quite quite a few dresses went into production. Actually, it's it's interesting, yeah. Or into prop buying. There's quite a few dresses that are prop buyers now. Yeah, so it's they, that was the fantastic thing at the BBC is that you could sort of soak up and learn and move to somewhere that was maybe more to your fancy, you know. And and it was appreciated, you know. You'd, you weren't knocked back for not having the right, I don't know, what they expect these days, but you know. As you went through, were there particular people you learned from or was, was every job a, a learning curve? Yeah, I think every job was a learning curve. Um, you used to do, you used to go and trail people. This is the way that you demonstrated that you were committed to and you were taking it seriously you you would use your own time to go and help in something and um i went and helped ruth mayorkas mark up a floor for rehearsals and and i'm pretty sure it was on a wooden dance floor unlike the ones where you've got the squares marked out on the floor we had to measure everything um, because the wooden dance floors were for the, they were sprung so that the dancers could not injure themselves. And that was on the first floor of the rehearsal rooms. Um, but when you're marking up for a drama, you have to measure it all out accurately. So yeah, but I did, I trailed uh, Ruth. I also, um, I went on location to Manchester. The, the production supplied a room for me to stay in. I, I went as a runner on a program called The Gathering Seed, 
So I, I was, I went as a, as an AFM substitute, but I was doing, I was calling the artist and the sporting artist, uh, making, in fact, when you get a lot of sporting artists, you need someone who, who can there and sort of herd them around and make sure they're all in the right place and they get to. So I did, I think I did about five days on um, Gathering Seed. Nigel Taylor was the um, production manager, I think. And I'd worked with him on Triangle. I was a dresser on Triangle and he was AFM, as was Corinne Hollingworth at the same time. They were on opposite teams. But yeah. And Ralph Walton was on Triangle. That's, that's, that's the soap opera that was set on a North Sea ferry that went backwards and forwards across the North Sea. I did the second series. And Kate O'Mara, of course, had been in the first series, but she did one, I think she came to do one day at, um, in Harwich, which was her leaving. So I didn't really work with Kate O'Mara um, on Triangle, but um, I had a ball. Being a dresser on Triangle was the best thing ever because we did every, every trip, whereas productions would just go on and go off. They were 10 day uh, trips on the ferry then, you had three days off. And being a dresser, you see, you just do what you're told to on the day. You know, you turn up for the shooting, um, you do the washing and the laundry and preparation for the next day, and, and then you can just go and party. And of course, we were on board the ship, um, and we were re we were recording while we were at sea, and then we would dock at like twelve or one, and we'd carry on shooting in an empty ship while the ship turned round, waiting the new passengers. The next passengers would get on, and we'd sail at about five, and we'd finish shooting about six. So then we're at sea. We didn't shoot at night. So what do you do? You drink, you dance, you eat a bit, you just party. It was brilliant. <laughs> oh, well, I'm glad you were able to make the most of that then. It's not every job you get something like that. No, it was uh, quite remarkable. <laughs> and then you'd, you'd get a day off in the middle of the 10 days. It would either be in Harwich, which was very rare, or more likely it was in Denmark, um, in Esbjerg. So that was good too. So yes, did a lot of Christmas shopping in Esbjerg. What a place to be when it's Christmas. Because we did three weeks shooting in Amsterdam, um, and then we just went backwards and forwards between Harwich and Esbjerg. And that was from September till December. I think on, on the note of having, you know, managing a nice bit of travel out of, of the BBC and, you know, Clearly had a great time doing it. I'd just like to say thank you very much for your time, Joe. You know, we but scratch the surface of some of your work, so thank you. Oh, yeah, sorry. Sorry if I've been talking rubbish. <laughs>